<clears throat> well, welcome again to Artbreak, everyone. Uh, pleased to announce that Artbreak has a new sponsor, corporate sponsor, Varnum LLP, as you see. And uh, we're always delighted to get that kind of support from the community. So, again, we're most appreciative. Well, embroidery, I think, uh, is an often underappreciated art form, even though it's uh, practiced by cultures throughout the world, and uh, many of the creations are really uh, sophisticated, imaginative, original. Um, but it's been um, traditionally, I think, been relegated or considered, quote, women's work, uh, and hasn't really received the attention. Fortunately, times have changed, and um, here now in the uh, 21st century, embroidery is really flourishing uh, in many different ways, uh, as opposed to just a traditional working on fabric. And um, in a sense, it's really been reclaimed by women artists. And uh, one of the forms that uh, has really developed is paper embroidery which allows an artist to work on paper that may have uh, an illustration, a photograph, um, other visual information, and incorporate embroidery um, into that. So we're very pleased to have with us today Jessica Sundstrom. And uh, Jessica is um, a paper embroidery artist. And uh, she recently had one of her pieces on display in the West Michigan area show. Um, in addition to being an artist, she is a familiar figure, I think, to many of you. She is the associate curator for youth and family programs here at the KIA. So she definitely has a very important and demanding day job, but I've still been able to uh, create. Them. So please welcome Jessica Sundstrom. Hi everyone. Um, like Greg said, my name is Jessica Sundstrom and I'm the Associate Curator of Youth and Family Programs here at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Um, and many of us who work here also have personal art practices or things that we love to do. Um, and this is my niche. <laughs> uh, I'm actually very surprised and pleased to see so many people here today because um, I do feel like it's a bit of a niche topic um, and I'm happy to be able to talk about it today. So um, this isn't a history of embroidery in general. Um, it's specifically on paper embroidery, but I'm gonna give you a little bit. I totally agree with Greg that embroidery and cloth um, is a very underappreciated form of creation in our society today. And that was not always the case. Um, there was a time when cloth was literally worth its weight in gold because creating cloth is an incredibly complicated process. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this kind of thought like literally the invention of thread is what has allowed people to create societies. Um, because once you were able to create thread, you were able to tie up animals for a farm. You were able to create, you know, bows and arrows to go hunting or fishing nets to catch fish. Um, if you wanted to be able to move from one place to the next. Thread was a, what allowed you to tie something up. So it's an incredibly important part of human history. Um, and I think maybe it's getting a little more appreciation, I would hope. <laughs> um, and also just for fun, uh, we think that thread was invented around 120 to 160,000 years ago. Um, and the earliest string that we have found is from 15,000 BCE in the Lascaux Caves, uh, the Painted Caves in Lascaux, France. And of course, where there was thread, there was embroidery. It is a form of embellishment, but it's also a form of mending. It's a form of tying things together. Um, and we have found, archeologists have found evidence of embroidery in fossilized remains of clothing from around 30,000 BCE uh, before Common Era in France. Um, we found it in fragments in Siberia from 6,000 to 5,000 before Common Era. We found silk embroidered remnants from Hubei province in China um, fifth to third century before Common Era. And it's generally accepted that we think embroidery originated in China, Siberia, Egypt, and spread um, to areas around it from there. Um, it's kind of hard to tell the history of thread 
because and embroidery in general because thread is made from natural materials or at least traditionally has been made from natural materials and so natural materials disintegrate they rot they you know die out um, with time and so it's hard to find that evidence but i think it's pretty cool we found it in fossils um, and just for fun as well we don't know who the earliest embroiderers were uh, we do have this idea that it's women's work but historically that hasn't always been the case there were for uh, example embroidery guilds um, throughout europe that kind of took power away from women by making it a men only field whereas you know once women were able to create their own wealth through embroidery and then it became a gilded activity and women were pushed up so it's not only women's work um, and um, embroidery has been really important throughout history a lot of traditions have been passed through embroidery and through the symbols that are put into embroidery and you know um, for women in the household, it has also been a way of preserving culture and preserving family traditions. Um, there's a really amazing book that I'll shout out right now called Threads of Light, which is about the history of embroidery throughout the world and how it is used today. Um, and I have a lot of sources, but that's one of my sources today. All right, so um, this is a photograph of me that was taken by Mary Whalen here at the Kirk Newman Art School. I started to embroider, um, it's not, <laughs> I've worked on it like, I don't even know, a minimum of 30 hours, I think. Um, eventually my idea is that it will become a night sky with stars in the background. And when I agreed to do this talk, I was like, I will absolutely have this done by this time. And I was wrong. <laughs> um, so I wanna start by talking about the person who really influenced me um, into exploring paper, in paper embroidery. His name is Maurizio Anzeri, and he is an Italian artist who lives and works in London. Um, and I used to work as the education assistant at the Saatchi Gallery in London, and um, they had quite a lot of works by him on display, and we used his works to create art lab projects for our teen visitors, our secondary student visitors. Um, and being able to look at his work every day kind of opened something back up in me. Um, that I had forgotten about. Um, and so I, you know, create, I started paper embroidery to teach it to students just as a little accentuation to their field trip to the gallery. Um, and then I really went from there. Um, and uh, I actually have an a image of Yvonne uh, in my bedroom um, printed on wood that I bought at the Sashi Gallery gift shop. So, uh, Maurizio Anzeri comes from a family of fishermen in Italy. Um, I think it's at least three generations of fishermen. And if you look at some articles, you'll see things that say, oh, he's, um, you know, taking this thing that's typically seen as a very feminine activity and he's making it masculine and he's challenging norms in this kind of way. And he actually has a quote where he says, like, I'm really amused that people look at my work and think of it that way because I think of stitching as a masculine activity because I come from a family of fishermen. I grew up watching them constantly using needle and thread to um, repair and create nets. And he says, I have no problem if people want to think of it that way, but that's not how I think of it. Um, he does describe it as drawing on paper, which is what a lot of people in the embroidery on paper world say. Um, and he creates masks for his, his uh, photos that he finds. He finds them in, um, you know, junk shops and flea markets, places like that. Um, and he creates a little, a little personality with them. Um, he says, and I agree personally, you never know what you're going to do until like you find the photo and then you'll find a photo and it will, I, I have a relationship with this and I know what I want to do. Um, <clears throat> so he often leaves, you know, maybe one aspect like an eye facing out. Um, and transforms their faces. But uh, he's been doing some really exciting things in the last few years. This is um, actually from a fashion shoot uh, where he partnered with a fashion photographer. And I will say, I found as many um, sources as I could for the works of art, but I couldn't find all of them. So I know that's Harriet, which actually in an article he said is his favorite um, from that series, but I couldn't find the name of this model. And then this is a 
kind of to show you, it starts with what the photo actually looks like and then how he transforms it. Um, and if any of you know about the old like ectoplasm spiritualism photos, um, where early photographers would take a picture and it was meant to show like a spirit was exiting the person's mouth as part of that uh, spiritualism movement that was part of the inspiration for this series. And then I thought these maps he did were very beautiful. He had a small exhibition of these. Um, and I always appreciate any photo that shows what they look like up close. And he does a lot of geometric kind of string artwork. Um, and I always appreciate anything that shows you the front and the back. So I just couldn't decide. There's way too many options. Um, and the head white 2023 is some of the stuff he's doing now, as well as these. And I think he's moving in a really cool direction. So he is who got me inspired. And I spent a lot of time trying to learn more and more. The more I work as an embroidery artist, the more I want to know about the history of thread, about the history of textiles in general. I started taking weaving here at the Kirk Newman Art School, so shout out for that if you're interested. Um, but the history of paper embroidery, the earliest account I could find of it was from 1775, um, which a woman created a few mottos or verses worked on perforated cardboard with colored yarn the woman was named Ann Fordham of Philadelphia from the origin and history of the Magnet McGinnis family by John F. McGinnis. That's the earliest mention of paper embroidery I found, um, 1775. But they think that one of the precursors to paper embroidery was Victorian pinprick paper, um, which is where you would take, you know, a needle and uh, create a design just pricking holes through. And they thought this kind of looks like um, various stitches and so they think that's part of why it started. Um, let's see what my next slide is. All right, so, but why would anyone want to embroider on paper? Um, paper is cheap, <laughs> that's the main reason. Um, it was a really, uh, a really good way for people to be able to practice. People were expected, particularly women, were expected to have good needlework skills and fabric was expensive. We don't think of it that way necessarily right now, but that's how it was. And so um, paper was a much cheaper option. And so people could make mistakes. Um, and also there was like a really good quote I read about how um, paper was considered a good canvas because it encouraged patience and attentiveness. Uh, it is very easy to tear your paper as you're uh, threading it. Um, it was used as an educational tool for children, both boys and girls in school. And um, however, surviving examples of Victorian children's paper embroidery is very rare. Um, and so perforated paper, it's a heavy cardboard. Uh, it came in varying sizes with varying sizes of hold. And uh, different kinds of threads were recommended based on the size of the hole. A thinner thread, you would use a silk. A bigger, or sorry, a, a thinner hole, you would use a silk. A bigger hole, you would use maybe like a wool yarn. And um, I put in this home sweet home as an example. Um, probably many of you in here have seen this and maybe didn't know it was on paper, but most of the old home sweet homes uh, are on paper. So let's see what the next one is. Prior to 1850, people made their own holes in their paper. Um, but it's kind of an arduous task. And so uh, where there's a will, there's capitalism. Um, so in the 1850s, perforated paper machines were invented so that they could start to mass produce what they were increasingly recognizing as an, a popular form of activity at home. Um, so the paper already came with the holes. Nobody had to do that labor at home. You could buy it in white, black, gold, silver, purple, lilac, yellow. Um, and then uh, it became even more popular in 1870s because that's when a form of printing on perforated paper was invented. They would engrave the design, lithograph it, and then print it. So now you could buy it already with Home Sweet Home printed on it, and you didn't have to figure out what it had to look like. You didn't have to draw it. You could just follow the pattern. Um, and let's see. Everyday objects made from perforated cardboard included 
boxes, baskets, calendars, 3D needle books, crosses, scented sachets, pin cushions, stamp books, wall pockets, and even lampshades. But by far the most popular embroidered creations were bookmarks, cards, and religious mottos, which is from Piecework Magazine. Um, the Hope Perforated Company at one point sold 65 bookmark designs in four different sizes. Um, and uh, I was going to say something just now that I forgot, but um, we haven't found a complete stitching guide, so we don't know if you could also buy it with the actual thread, um, at least from my research. So maybe you could pick out your own colors. Maybe the colors were provided to you. And, um, you know, so that kind of brings in this idea that uh, the only unique thing about these was if you got to select the paper or the kind of thread you use, the color of thread you use, and um, the skill you personally had as you were working on them. Um, so another interesting quote I found was that the new printing processes made the product increasing incredibly popular, or I think that they actually said all the rage, and by the 1870s, desirable to the point of excess. Um, and apparently these were also called the poor women's samplers because the materials were so affordable. Uh, it was affordable to create them and it was affordable to make them. Um, and these are some real examples of paper bookmarks. Um, that lacy looking thing is actually paper as well. Um, and I kind of wanted to throw in something. Um, this wasn't the only form of I'm gonna say craft that was um, being sold on like a mass consumerism scale. Uh, at the exact same time in the 1850s-ish, uh, something called Berlin wool work was created. Um, all these new fun synthetic dyes, you could make really bright green yarn or really turquoise blue. Um, and so they started selling basically like cross stitch patterns that you could use to make a chair cushion and things like that. Um, I kind of think of, my mom had this little black, uh, coin pouch with very bright floral cross stitch looking um, flowers on it. And um, I just, I think this is interesting. It's not directly related to paper embroidery, but I have this scathing review of Berlin wool work. The kits reduce the artistic genius of old masters and contemporary artworks to pixelated pastiches of the originals. The fad for Berlin wool work was a symptom of how far the creative nerve of domestic needlewomen had been crushed, extinguished to the point when women were seduced by the manufacturer's insinuation that it was more artistic to imitate the paintings of celebrated male artists in an excess of lurid stitches than to devise original embroidery of their own, embroidery which, through the centuries, had become devalued as merely women's work. Um, I think that's from Threads of Life, the book I mentioned earlier. Well, I know it is. Um, and I think that's a really interesting point. Um, if you look throughout history, women had power through cloth, through needlework, and uh, creating, this is basically paint by numbers, you know? So creating this, um, it was easy and it was fun, and I have no problem with paint by numbers, but there is an argument to be made about what kind of, creativity uh, was lost or what kind of um, innovation was lost um, through women, you know, saying this is the fad and I'm going to follow the fad. Here's an example from the V&A's collection um, from Vienna. And then embroidered panel on paper. Also, uh, this one's from the V&A as well. Um, I kind of wondered if it was paper or a fabric that was glued to paper, but I don't think it was because you can see that there's writing on the back and on the back it says uh, Margaret 1819 Camelford Cornwall. And this is a fun thing I found as well. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, when she was four years old, um, did this what they called paper drawing for her doctor uh, when he had a baby, when his wife had a baby. So. Um, Perforated paper needlework began to decline in the early 1900s, um, with its popularity pretty much dying out by 1920. Um, and part of that was linen and canvas embroidery bases became more affordable. 
Um, and so kits were still sold um, for children and for schools to uh, kind of teach that. But by 1920, they were pretty much gone. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think they kind of live on in a way through lacing cards that are sold for children's education. Um, and then you might be familiar with embroidered postcards from World War I. Uh, these are not embroidered on paper. They're actually machine embroidered, and then they're put into a paper frame. Um, so I threw that in for fun. And in the 1970s-ish, um, let's say 1950 to 1970, as best I can tell, um, it became a thing in Europe to buy a hand-embroidered a uh, postcard that you could send off. Um, the Leiden Textile Research Center says that from their research, what they can tell is um, that the factory or the postcards were made in factories. And then uh, some person at home probably made a few dollars uh, embroidering them. Um, and there must be a layer of paper in between because we don't see any thread on the back. Um, the one on the left, is also from the Textile Research Center in Leiden. The one on the right is from eBay. <laughs> um, in the, I have this one out of order actually, but I'll say in the 1990s, um, a Dutch woman named Erica Fortkins, I don't speak Dutch, so I'm not sure, um, started publishing all these books on paper embroidery. Um, and that kind of started to, I think, bring it back as a craft. She also started selling stenc selling stencils that you could buy. Um, I have quite a few of her books. They're not in print anymore, but you can get them on used book sites. Um, and she does a lot of very geometric work, a lot like Maritza and Zeri, actually. Um, and there's a website called Stitching Cards, and they say that they think she was really influenced by string art, which some of you might be familiar with, and which was invented by a woman. This is the earliest kind of artwork that I could find, and I'm sure there's others. And if you know, I'd love to know of um, Elaine Rychek, who created these paper embroidery works, um, uh, or Gandhi sewn to Kazoshi paper. And um, in the 1970s and 80s is when feminist artists started to reclaim embroidery as an art form um, and not just quote unquote women's work. But uh, Elaine has a quote where she says something like, I wish I could tell you that I was really influenced by the feminist art movement that was happening at the time and my embroidered works were definitely a part of this movement, uh, movement but I can't because I was really isolated and you know there wasn't a ton of like information about how women across the world were creating art. But um, I thought they were very beautiful. So if you went to Elaine Rychek's site, you can see her early examples of sewn work. Um, all right, so that is the history about 160, 80 years, I'm not good at math, of history. Um, and then I wanted to talk about some artists that are practicing now. And I would not be able to tell you every artist that I know about or follow, um, but I chose some of my favorites. So this is Han Kao. Um, she is in Texas. She has an exhibition that's about to open in like three days. Um, I think at a gallery called Paradigms with another embroidery artist um, named Fiance Knowles, who's from South Africa, but she does not do paper embroidery, and I'm sure there's others in there, but they're two of my favorite embroidery artists right now. Um, and I didn't include the uh, credit line for that work because I couldn't find it, but that is a sienna type, so I did include it because we do offer um, every now and then embroidered sienna type workshops with the Kirk Human Art School. Um, so, um, Han Kao put purchases most of her photographs from flea markets and antique shops that she finds while she's traveling. And, uh, this might be a question that people will ask, um, people have asked me, you know, how do you feel about taking these photos that were somebody's treasured memories and transforming them? Um, so for that question, uh, Kao says, and I'm apologizing now if I'm not pronouncing her name correctly. There's thousands upon thousands of vintage photos stuffed inside dusty boxes at these markets, long lost and forgotten by their families. So my work is an attempt to bring them back and renew their stories. I'm particularly drawn to images that offer 
a deeper story. Photographs with haunting faces and figures, simple landscapes that can be magically transformed with added dimension and color. Um, I don't know if it's a inclination of embroidery in general. I don't know if it's an inclination of people. Um, a lot of us in the paper embroidery world seem to enjoy covering faces. Um, so Han Kao has a series of images where people's faces have been transformed into flowers. She has a series of what uh, the combustion series, as we can see. Um, this is one of her newest series, and it's part of what's going to be in her exhibition. And I think it's really, really cool. Um, instead of you know going over the photo, cutting images out of the photo, and then adding embroidery behind it. Um, and I would say this is probably one of the first artists for embroidery on paper that I became exposed to, and I'm a massive fan of hers. I have some of her postcards. Um, so this is Victoria Villasana, or Villasana. She was born in Guadalajara, and she splits her time right now between Mexico and um, England. And she, from her website, is a textile artist, installation, and street artist, and her work explores interconnection and the people who create change throughout history, pop culture, social causes, and our reconnection with nature. Through pattern, geometry, and color, she uses intricate visual stories which reflect the resilience and triumph of the human spirit. Um, and so in her work, you might see familiar faces like Yayoi Kasoma, uh, Muhammad Ali, Frida Kahlo, Misty Copeland, David Bowie. Um, and you may also see unfamiliar figures, such as embroidered photographs of the Seri or Comac, uh, Comac indigenous people near what is now Sonoma, Mexico, or her in um, embroidered images of alabrides, which are Mexican folk fantastical creatures. Right. Um, the Alabrijes were a commission. And then um, on the right, this is a, I meant to look this pronunciation up, but I apologize. Uh, Amuche, I believe, or Muxas, which is a term given by the Zapoteco indigenous community of Oaxaca to describe any person with a different sexual orientation. This piece is to honor the Muxes and their determination to defend their rights. Um, so she has a lot of very social activist um, work. She works really small. This is what I was talking about, street art installation. So she prints these stickers, basically, and then she'll leave them around town. Um, and she works really big, like on that canvas of James Baldwin. So, you know, you can take an image and print it onto another piece of paper. Um, if, you're, if your original image is smaller or if it's, you know, owned by somebody else. Um, and also... She often leaves threads hanging as a way of um, kind of confronting the ideas of boundaries. The image on the my left um, is a um, collaboration with another artist. She often collaborates with other artists. This is with photographer John Shivis, um, featuring a Huicha uh, Cole indigenous person. Um, who the Huichicole are known in Mexico for their art and traditions. And these artworks were sold to provide access to healthcare, um, particularly eye healthcare for that community. Um, and then on the right, she has the fabric of reality, um, which is about the five alchemical colors, black, red, white, blue, and yellow. Um, it shows the Fibonacci sequence, and it's meant to show order and chaos and how everyone creates their own reality through their own tunnel of perception. This is from the We Are Nature series. If you went to her Instagram, all of the quotes from the We Are Nature series are quotes from Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, who is probably best known for writing Braiding Sweetgrass, um, which is a wonderful book. This is Julie Cockburn. Um, she is an artist in England. Uh, her technique is a little bit different. Um, so she says that her art tells the truth in a circuitous way. She finds her source material online and in junk shops, and she describes the moment of discovery as euphoric. Um, and then what she does is she scans her images, she puts them into Photoshop, and she plays around with how she could transform them. 
And then when she's ready to work, um, she takes her original image and she backs it with fabric. And backing it with fabric makes it more stable. Um, it's something I personally haven't done, but I have backed other images, uh, my photographs with paper sometimes. Um, and then um, here is an example of how she would have printed that and then um, started to work on it. And then in this post, she had said something about how it wasn't working. So she snipped the threads off. Um, and um, one of the things I really admire about her and I'm often puzzled by, um, the stitch you're seeing is called satin stitch. And I don't, I don't really understand how she has such a seamless <laughs> um, series of circles. Um, you can't really see the holes. So the size of her, I'm going to guess milliner's needle must be really small, but also even with that backing of another piece of fabric on the back, I'm, I'm always trying to puzzle how she isn't tearing, um, and how you're not seeing evidence of that tearing. Um, so she, this is an artist I really admire for her technical skill. Um, she also has a fun story. Somebody asked her like, has anybody ever seen uh, a photo like that you embroidered and been like, that's me. <laughs> um, and she says it happened to her once a lady got in touch and said that the picture was of her grandmother and she bought it. And that piece was called the accident. Um, and here's more of her. She does a lot of other things. These are some of them that I really love. Um, but there is a lot of like uh, geometry and things. Um, this is Petra Heydrich. She's in Germany. Um, she used to work as a costume designer, which is how she became involved with textiles. Um, and in the last few years, she's really been focusing on collage with embroidery. Um, and um, again, we can see like that, I always want to call it thread geometry, but that's like actually a form of physics. Um, so I'll say that kind of string art, uh, she uses a lot of that. And I, I think it's a really beautiful way of um, drawing attention to certain parts of the work. But I also think it's really cool how she uses uh, other paper ephemera to create those collage works. Um, and I also always like it when you can see the process. Um, so here, you know, she's shown how she's using pre uh, pre made holes, which is a really important part of your embroidery process for paper. Um, and then, you know, I love a variegated thread, but she clearly uses a different thread for each thing, and that must take a really long time. <laughs> uh, this is Yukimi Akiba. She is in Japan. Um, in 2018, she was given a Polaroid camera and she used that Polaroid camera to start taking self portraits that she then had every intention of destroying through thread um, and other things. Um, and it was a way for her to uh, process, she'd been given a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So it was a way for her to process, um, process like therapy for herself through her art. And, um, she says, one day out of sheer boredom, I decided to use embroidery on my self-portraits with the intention of completely destroying them. While I felt guilty, the mere act of piercing the photograph was liberating. It was the genesis of my creative, of my series, Creative Self-Destruction. Um, and since 2019, she's thrown herself into a creative and emotional world, but she's also been isolating herself from the people in real world instead. Um, I believe that's a quote from her actual website. And art plays an important role as therapy um, she has this series called Ukyo A Pop. Um, so, you know, she does her own photographs. She's also found old, uh, Ukyo A images. Um, and so if the image is damaged, she can kind of fix it with thread. This is the same one, but, uh, the threads have been left out so you can move the thread and it's called the wind rises. So you can kind of imagine, or at least I imagine that the thread is meant to represent how the wind might blow in different directions. Um, and so, you know, here's another, people are asking, you're taking someone else's image, you're embroidering on it, don't you feel bad? She says, um, I've always chosen old unsold materials that have been forgotten, have not yet found a home or have lost their homes. I was hesitant to sew on art because I thought it would be rude, but if it's going to be forgotten and thrown away, there's nothing to do but do it. 
And I guess if I were an ukiyo-e artist, I'd tell me to do it. Welcome to 2021. Thanks to all ukiyo-e artists and to everyone who welcomes this kind of work. Um, so a lot of artists see this as a way of honoring things that might otherwise be forgotten. Um, and I just think her form of composition is mesmerizing. And if I ever have a few extra hundred dollars, I'm going to order one of these from Japan. <laughs> Uh, Jessa Fairbrother is an artist that I've only recently, in the last, let's say, year, come across. She's also in England. Um, she does a lot of either photographs of her own or um, collaborates, is my understanding. Um, and when I first began to stitch, it was from a place of great urgency. I later realized the purpose was an attempt to tether myself to a happy ending, literally and metaphorically sewing myself to something I yearned for, but was never going to be mine. When I use no thread at all, just the perforation of the needle or the poking of the hole, it stems from the deeply felt sense I have been severed from all these possibilities. There is nothing to bind me. I drift and make my own story. And this image um, just took my breath away when I first saw it. Um, Natalie Chico Rico, I think is Dutch, living in California. And I included her to show it doesn't just have to be on photos or postcards. Um, this is clearly a nicer, maybe a handmade paper. I'm not sure using natural materials. Um, the one with the stick is from her nesting series, which she started in 2020 during lockdown. Uh, this is the color hole series. This is the holding series, which I think is one of her newest. The holding series involves the key. The um, branch involves nesting. And then um, another example of that is this artist, Alicia Godwin, who makes her own watercolors and then embroiders them, picks complementary thread colors, um, creates a really beautiful iridescent look. Uh, and Hinka Schroeders, um, a Dutch artist, who is another artist who kind of baffles me with um, the skill she uses. And then me. <laughs> um, so again, that's a really, really, really super duper brief uh, showing of, of artists who use it. But um, I thought I should also put in some of my work because that's what we wrote. <laughs> um, this is the photo I showed you at the very beginning. And then I love to see the back. Um, if you were to be embroidered with a hoop on fabric, we call that hoop guts or hoop butt. Um, and sometimes I think the back is more interesting than the front. This is a piece that maybe you have seen. Uh, if you haven't, it's literally right here. You can come and see it afterwards. It's called Dear Jan. Um, and it was just in the West Michigan area show, which I was very pleased to be accepted into. Um, and that's not the order. That's just when I was taking photographs. Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about why I like textiles. <laughs> um, my mother was Jan in this work of art. And my mother was an amateur seamstress and I think really would have been good enough to be a professional seamstress. Uh, she can make you anything you could ever want. She could knit you anything you could ever want. She could embroider anything you could ever want. And so I grew up in a house that was just filled with these kinds of materials. Um, I taught myself how to thread paint out of boredom because it was there. <laughs> um, and I will say I'm, I'm entirely self-taught. Um, I've taken a couple workshops, but like later after I had already started practicing. Um, and I often wanted my mom to teach me how to sew. Um, and unfortunately, that just never uh, ended up working out for us. So this piece, which I created this past year, is all of the embroidery photo or all of the photos from her yearbook. Um, some of them have got things written on the back, uh, you know, have a great summer, hope we can stay friends. Um, and some of them don't. And I think there's, I, I can't remember how many there are, like 40 perhaps, or 35. Um, and I worked on this project for a really long time. <laughs> and the one in the bottom corner with all the blue and green French knots, that piece itself probably took me a minimum of 10 hours. Um, and it's very small, so that might be surprising. Uh, you really have to be mindful of not tearing the work as you're working on it. But um, 
this was a really personal piece to me. It was really meant to kind of be a way for me to explore my relationship with my mother through these people who I don't know anything about. I know one other person's name um, that my mother told me, but um, I made a lot of calls and I tried to be sensitive to, you know, not doing anything. There's a very real possibility that someone could have walked in and seen their photo on the wall. Um, my mother's not from Kalamazoo, but she's not from far. And she did come to Kalamazoo for a while for college. Um, and I did actually, after opening weekend, receive an email that said, I was so excited to see my friends on the wall. And I go back and I was like, oh, are you really? <laughs> are you really in here? And she said, you know, metaphorically, like, um, which is something I heard a lot, that a lot of people were um, enjoying the nostalgia of seeing the hairstyles and the outfits from their youth. Um, each row alternates uh, what I see uh, and perceive as male, female. Some of their images are covered um, either to kind of convey maybe they have a dubious personality. I don't know. Maybe they have a dubious future. I don't know. Some of them I kind of gave stereotypes, um, sweet and uh, sweet and spicy, let's say, or Superman. Some of them, there's really writing on the back. And um, I embroidered sections of what was written on the back. Um, so, you know, somebody named Ruth said, let's stay friends. And there was more than let's stay friends, but I chose specific phrases that I thought kind of reflected on um, who, what my mother's life would become. Um, and again, that's up here. So if you want to come up and see it after the presentation is over, you're welcome to, and you're welcome to um, touch it if you have clean hands um, and flip it over and look on the back if you want. It's um, sewn onto fabric. I didn't include any process photos of that, but I took each photo, put them on a big board, measured out a space so that they'd be as equal as I could make them took sewing pins and put them through every four corners of every single photo. And then one by one would lift a corner and do a French knot through the fabric to secure the photo to the fabric. Um, it was a very painful process. I have a lot of pin holes in my legs as I was doing it. Um, and, but one of the nice things about it, it's meant to look like a yearbook. The alternate title for this is the yearbook. Um, one of the nice things is if I ever wanted to display it in a different way, I can literally cut it off of the back. Uh, this is Midnight Gathering. I sometimes call it Midnight Picnic. Um, and it's an old postcard. It's written in another language. Um, and it is a really delicate piece of uh, material. So I actually did very minimal embroidery on it because I was really worried about um, having it break apart. You can see there's all kinds of things that have already broken off. So I mainly did um, metallic watercolor on it uh, for the accentuation or embellishment. Um, these are some pieces that, you know, I, I really like that string art look that a lot of um, people use. And I also really like taking things away um, so I've been exploring using paper cutters to remove aspects, um, and then how can I use a different material, like a shining piece of paper, which I'm very drawn to shine and glitter. <laughs> um, so this one doesn't have a title right now, um, and it's crooked for the photo, but it's actually mounted onto this, uh, polka dotted thing. I was kind of thinking about calling her Lisa after Lisa Frank. And, um, on the other side, we've got Beguiled, um, this person who is maybe going to a dance, going to a wedding, I'm not sure. Um, and like I said, I feel like a lot of us paper embroidery artists like to remove the face for some reason. Uh, the one on the left is actually in a private collection. Um, the one on the right is Vera. And sometimes I think you don't have to do a lot. You don't have to embroider every single thing. So I just chose to outline Vera's face and the face of the statue. Um, but Vera holds a really special place in my heart because uh, my grandmother was named Vera and my grandmother was an artist. So I feel a really strong connection to that work. Um, this is me as a baby. Um, and I think this piece will be in the upcoming Kirk Human Art School faculty review. 
Uh, it's a diptych. It's meant to be displayed together. Um, reflections on the future. It's symbolic for me. Uh, Descent 2020. And then um, this one is a print that I made um, in printmaking studio. It's not done. It's one of those pieces that I put down and then I think I should really continue to work on that. Um, I think it has potential and then I put it down and I'll get to work on it someday. Uh, this one doesn't have a title yet. It's almost done, but you can see that it's got some holes poked through. Um, this is another work that's really damaged and the corner is actually breaking off. So the embroidery thread is keeping the work together. Uh, this is a postcard picking oranges in Florida and I just did French knots. This is a piece I made for a friend. Um, I made a cyanotype, well, Mary Whalen <laughs> made a negative of a photo and then we turned it into a sienna type. And then I embellished it to give it to my friend um, as a present of her and her daughter at the beach. And that's the back, which again, I always like to see. And that's a detail of there's beads on the sides that you wouldn't see because I chose them to blend in with the color of the sienna type chemistry. Uh, this is another sienna type I made um, as a housewarming present. The work of the person is actually who the present was for, and it's actually embroidery that I did on cloth, not on paper. Um, playing around with watercolors and mixed media and thread. Uh, created handmade paper that I made in the back with some collage paper, watercolors. Um, that one's called Blue Landscape. I clearly forgot to put it in. The other one is a nightscape. Um, I wanted to try to make clouds. Um, you can make really cool clouds on cloth, but it's quite a challenge on paper. So I made pom poms instead. Uh, and then I made some uh, engravings of snowflakes and um, the engraving plate caught every mistake you could possibly make. So rather than being sad about it, I decided to see what I could do with thread and paint and beads. Um, and then if you want to learn how to do this, <laughs> um, first you would need an image or a piece of paper, and maybe you want to use tracing paper to draw out whatever you'd like to do. Some people do it that way. Uh, sometimes I do, but actually most of the time I don't. Um, but you know, you could play around, see what you wanted to do, and if it works, if it doesn't work, um, and then get an awl or something pointy and put a piece of craft foam behind it. Uh, that will really help as you're not going to be hitting the resistance of a hard surface. You're going to have your um, all sink straight through and give you a nice needle hole or a nice hole. Um, typically you want to use an awl or something that you poke with that is larger than the needle you're going to use. And um, be mindful of the size of your needle, be mindful of how much thread you're going to use, one thread or one strand, two strands, etc. Um, the more strands you use, the further apart you want your holes to be. Again, they are going to tear every time you go through. Um, that is a really brief snippet of how you can do that. But if you want to learn, <laughs> um, I'm offering Embroidery 101 here at the Kirk Human Art School in September. I'm going to do a shorter one with Kalamazoo Dry Goods, which is an amazing place to buy your embroidery supplies. That's just down the street. December 2nd, paper embroidery. I think we're doing holiday themed um, with Kalamazoo Dry Goods. And by holiday themed, I mean make a holiday card or make a present for somebody. Um, January 20th, I think sheer snowflake embroidery or Kirk Newman Art School. You need some experience for that because it's a different experience um, using sheer fabric. Uh, March 16th and 17th, mixed media embroidery on paper. So that work that I call blue landscape with the handmade paper is something I made as an example for um, that. And then see my work. Uh, Kalamazoo Dry Goods, we're planning a little mini exhibition of my work. Some of it will be on sale. We don't have a firm date sometime in October. And then Kirk Newman Art School. Again, I think faculty review October 14th through 28th. Um, Thank you very much. And if anyone has a question, I'm happy to answer. Oh, <laughs> my final thing. I'm the Associate Curator of Youth and Family Programs. If you know anyone that likes to build Legos, we're having Lego night with bricks and mini things next Friday. Um, and there will be an ice cream truck on site. It's not part of your ticket because not everyone eats ice cream. But 
you do get a mini fig, a mini figure to take home with your ticket, and there's gonna be lots of fun activities, and it's steam, so you know, engineering and art together. So next Friday, 5 30 to 7 30. <laughs> now I'll take questions. Oh yes. I don't work with paper mache. I'm I, I wouldn't mind, but I haven't used it. So Gail does. Gail Swank Reyes. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming today. And um, this work is up here. If you want to come and look at it, if you want to ask me a question, I'm happy to answer them. And otherwise, thanks for coming. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.